everyone, and welcome to Book Break, Greece Public Library's place for book recommendations. I am Claire. I'm a librarian here, and I moderate As the Page Turns and our historical group on Facebook. And today I have a special guest, one of our newer librarians. Her name is Kim. My name is Kim Whittemore, and I'm looking forward to starting a brand new book club here called Sheer Indulgence. We'll be having our kickoff on Wednesday, May 24th at 2 o'clock. Awesome. In fact, so we're going to talk about that book, we're going to share, uh, hopefully I can entice some people to maybe be interested in joining us. For well, the book it's a book that I've been interested in reading, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that one, so... All right. So today we're just doing kind of a roundup of books, so no particular theme. So there's a little bit of everything in today's episode. Um, I am going to start with a historical fiction that I just read. It was a Book of the Month club pick for me, and it was called The House is on Fire by Rachel Beanlin. And she also wrote a book called Florence Adler Swims Something that was pretty popular, I remember, a year or two ago. So this one was set in Virginia in 1811, and it is the height of the winter social season. And the night after Christmas, the theater is packed with more than 600 holiday revelers when, unfortunately, a fire occurs. So the story is told from points of view of four different main characters in the book, some are attending the performance. One is a young man that works backstage, and another person is a slave, and he is actually helping rescue people outside the theater. So our first person is Sally, Sally Henry Campbell, and the name Henry in Richmond, Patrick Henry, it's a very famous old Southern name. She is a widow. She's on one of the third floor boxes, and she's with her sister-in-law, Margaret, and her brother-in-law, Archie. Then we have Cecily Patterson. She is a young enslaved woman. She's in the colored gallery, so they have like a section for slaves or people of color. She is very happy to get away from her master's son for the evening, who has been abusing her, and she's supposed to meet her mistress. Like She's there as a chaperone. Uh, Miss Maria Price at a designated spot at the end of the performance. Maria is attending the theater with her friends. The stagehand is a young man named Jack Gibson, and he is supposed to change over the sets and the props, and he really aspires to be an actor. So he's doing this, but he has like a motive that he really wants to continue and be an actor and a person on the stage, not just the person changing the, ch the stage set. So unfortunately, Jack has missed his cue for lowering and raising a chandelier, which of course is lit with candles, and that is where our problem comes from. The last person that you hear from is a, a gentleman named Gilbert Hunt, Gilbert is actually a trained blacksmith. He is a slave, but he is earning money. He's been earning money doing commission jobs on the side because he wants to buy his freedom, and also he is married. Um, his wife is a house servant in Richmond, so he's trying to earn enough money to free the both of them. So when the theater goes up in flames... Sally and Jack, everybody has to make decisions quickly. It's horrible. Um, you know, so that's like the bulk of the, the very first part of the book. The second part of the book is what happens afterwards, who to cast for the blame. And that's when it really starts to get dicey because the theater company doesn't want to be blamed so they claim it was a slave uprising and they knocked over something and then this fire started. So now you have the people of the town that are very oh, motivated to go after people of color. So it turns into a horrible situation. And then the newspapers are trying to figure out what actually really happened. 
people are being coerced to lie. Mm-hmm. And then you have um, the one widow who does make it. She's trying to help other people that were burned and everything in the fire. There wasn't enough room in hospitals. Like people are in private homes, like being attended to. It was just the weirdest thing. <laughs> reading about this and trying to figure out how this was all going what down. What was the time frame? I think you said 1811. It. Okay. So this is pre-Civil War. Yeah. Um, and then the young woman that was enslaved that was there chaperoning her mistress was not counted among the living. So she's like, okay, well, if I'm dead, maybe now's a great time to escape. <laughs> so that's another storyline that's happening. But... Um, so each of the main characters has problems they're trying to solve, and it was just an interesting family saga, and also learning about the history of that time, because um, you don't really read a lot about kind of pre-Civil War time yeah. in the South, and this was an actual event. So a lot of the author's notes at the end, which I love a good author's yeah. note, <laughs> kind of goes into what what was real, what she fabricated, and so forth. So, yeah, um, The House is on Fire by Rachel Beanlin. Very good. Yeah. So what do you have got for I us, I was Kim? thinking to jump right in with This Time Tomorrow okay. by Emma Straub. And this is the title that we're going to do for Shelf Indulgence, May 24th. So I'm going to try to intrigue some folks to join us. Um, I think I should mention that I listened to it as an audiobook. Okay. And I have found that I really like this narrator. Um, Marin Ireland has oh, done she's, yeah. a lot of books that I've really enjoyed. And I, I actually just, have one but that I listened to by her today as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. So our main character, Alice, is about to turn 40 years old. She lives in New York City, and she is in a relationship. She's content. She has a job that she kind of admits she's just kind of drifting through life, not really with a plan or particular um, sense of urgency around anything. She is, unfortunately, visiting her dad in the hospital. He's very ill. He's um, likely to be dying very soon. And it's, so it's a very, it's weighing heavily on her that she's going to turn 40 and, and she's in this sad situation. Um, her dad's name is Leonard and he is the author of a time travel book that um, featured two brothers. So now he is, he is in the hospital. Um, Alice goes out to celebrate her birthday with her best friend, Sam. And Sam gets called away because there's some urgent stuff going on with her kids back home in New Jersey. So did I say New York City, by the way? We're, we're, yes. We're, okay, yes. we're in New York City. And the location actually is very specifically described in terms of which train station and where they are going in different times in the, in the plot. And she lives on Pomander Walk, which I looked up and it really is a place on the Upper West Side. So we're, we're in Manhattan and uh, it was an interesting part of the story. I wish I was more familiar with New York City so I could have mm-hmm. pictured where they were going. But Sam gets drunk, she collapses in the shed because she can't find the key to get into their apartment. So she's, she's at home, but not in her house. When she wakes up in the morning, she is suddenly 16 years old. So while there is a time travel element to this story, it really isn't a sci-fi book in the way I would expect. So it's, it's much more driven the storyline by the relationships and particularly the relationship she has with her dad. Right, and getting to see her dad as like a person that's her age, from what I remember reading. Now he's this healthy, vibrant person. She gets to remember the conversations they had at the breakfast table Mm -hmm. and the work he was doing, the the writing, the... uh, the relationships he has with other writers and, and attending these science fiction uh, conventions. Mm-hmm. So he has a whole fan base that adores the story of, of the traveling, the time traveling twins. Time travel is pretty fascinating. It doesn't end up being a huge component of the storyline. They do. Ex- he, um, 
it, it's actually Leonard that explains it to her eventually. Okay. But she goes back in time. She makes multiple trips because she's trying to figure out if there's a way, if something could change, could she could she save her dad? Okay. Could she put him on a better path? And and so she tosses in little things like, hey, quit smoking and maybe go for a, let's go for a walk, you know, instead okay. of we're sitting at home having, you know, uh, time at, in front of the couch. Um, so the, the one thing I thought was worth mentioning that Emma made this book rather autobiographical because she was writing it in 2020 when her dad who is an author himself of horror and suspense movie books, um, was facing a very serious heart condition in 2020 okay. when she was writing this book. So she, she drew heavily from real life. She was living in New York City. It's all um, very, I'm sure, very much from the heart that she was experiencing this that and sounds... worried about the relationship and, and worrying about her dad. Right, yeah. So I think that's something a lot of people can relate to as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was also fun that she tossed in some, some references back to that sci-fi time travel aspect where she, she covered um, Peggy Sue Got Married or Back to the Future. And, and she was worried about the time traveling DeLorean and, and just how her time travel worked. She was trying to understand it. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Don't yeah, you don't want to give any, too any much giveaway. away. Right. Right. No, it sounds sounds really good. Yeah. And uh, like I said, Wednesday, May 24th. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll try to uh, see what everybody else thinks about it. Okay. Sounds good. So my next book was one of my most anticipated books of 2023. It was called I Have Some Questions for You by Rebecca Bakai. But unfortunately, this book was not what I had hoped. Um, and that happens sometimes. And the funny thing is, is there were some very prominent authors like Chris Beaujolais or Belgian and Angie Kim, who we had here for um, Grease Reads one year, you know, who raved about this book, loved the voice. It, it's a mystery, but I would say it's a more literary mystery. Like, it's not what I would call like a thriller, typically. But um, I'll tell you about it, and I will let you make your own decision, um, because I think it is definitely a book that it may not have worked for me, but it may well work for you. Or So Bodie Kane is my main character. She's a successful podcaster, and she returns to her old boarding school in New Hampshire, to teach a course, like a kind of like a mini master course. So while she's back at her old school, she starts to re-examine a murder that happened to one of her former classmates, who one year was her roommate at the school. Um, her name was Thalia Keith, and some of her podcasting students express an interest in doing like a episodes or podcast about this murder. So it's starting to reignite her interest and make her look back at this event and start to really wonder like, hmm, did we get the right person? Like, was this how this really was supposed to go? Because you're judging it now f from a totally different standpoint, okay. you know? Um, so many of the chapters began with snippets from present day news about murders and sexual abuse of women. They never named names, but they were just statements, which that kind of threw me off. I didn't like that writing technique at all. Uh, for example, one of them was like, or rather, where the chef hanged himself in his empty restaurant because the rape charges were about to be filed. And I'm sitting there thinking, do I know this person? <laughs> Am I supposed to know what this is happening? You know? Um, so to me, instead of bringing up the commentary of what I think she was trying to do was how America is obsessed with crimes that involve women. And we sensationalize them yeah. and we delve into them like anyone can remember the couple in Utah and how much that was on the news and so forth. But um, so I kind of get what she was trying to do. It's just her method didn't work for me. But um, and the author, the way the book is written, it's written to you. It's written to a, 
and it's not a fictitious you, after a while you begin to figure out that Bodhi is writing this to her former music teacher, whom she was a little obsessed with, and she starts to realize that he had inappropriate relationships with some of the students, including the young woman that died, Mm -hmm. And she starts to spin this around in her mind instead of like looking at the facts in a in just a clear cut way, saying, Okay, well this is who was apprehended, you know, this is the way the teacher behaved. She just starts going into all her own personal stuff, which I was just like, Okay, Bodhi, I, I really didn't need to know all this about you. <laughs> Let's get back to the crime. But um so the the Convicted killer was a man named Omar Evans, and he was a black man. He was, I believe, the only black employee at the school at that time, and he was an athletic trainer. And he was, it was pretty much a very fast, supposedly cut and dry case. Well, of course, when they start doing the podcast, and then there's another podcaster, like out in the public, that starts researching as well, you find out there was a lot of things that never even were investigated. A lot of, um, they actually found things on the campus that were never found before, like articles of evidence. Um, So they bring up a new trial. But meanwhile, Bodhi is still talking about this case. And that was, you know, that was another thing. It's like, to me, like when you're in a case, you probably should sequester yourself, you know, as not to prejudice, you know, throw prejudice against the game. Well, she doesn't. She just continues to talk to all the people that were being interviewed and so forth, other suspects. But um, And then there was another sideline story where her husband, who was older than her, was accused of like a Me Too type of moment. So for me personally, it was a little too much going on. And I didn't understand why all this kept being thrown in when, meanwhile, I was just like, I just want to know who killed Thalia. That's all I want to know, you know? (laughs) And eventually I did find that out, but it took too long for me. So, and maybe that's what they mean by a literary mystery, but. Sounds very complicated. (laughs) It was very complicated. So in summary, I didn't connect with Bodhi or the other boarding school characters. And maybe that's a thing too, is like, that's a certain level of wealth and privilege and everything else that's up there. I mean, this is not your typical high school atmosphere. So was this like really plot driven or was it sort of meta in a way? I think it was more meta. Yeah. Did you ever read Lincoln in the Bardo? No. Okay. No, but I started at, at George Saunders. Yeah, is it yeah. like that? Where there's interjections after almost every part or? Not really. Okay. It was just weird. I, I I can't explain it. And I think that it must be the way she wrote it and just the way the character was. It, it was it's something you're either gonna like or you're not gonna like. And unfortunately I was I am not liking this. But you know. She has one I should bring up that Rebecca Mackay won a Pulitzer Prize for her other book, which I cannot think of the name right now. I believe it had to do with the AIDS crisis in the 1990s. The Great Believers, possibly. I think that's what it was. So, I mean, this woman obviously can write. It was. I think it's just a question of sometimes the book may not be for you. It may not be the right time for you, you know. So, mm. yeah. So I'm very curious. If, if you've read this book, let me know. I'm dying to hear other people's thoughts. I do think it would be a good book for a book discussion because I find that when a book makes you feel strongly about it, whether or not it's like or dislike, that that's a great book to discuss. Mm. Some of my best book discussion books have been books that not everyone has liked. Sure. Yeah. So... So I will I will leave you to it, Kim. Okay. What what do you got for us? I probably won't pick up that one. <laughs> but I'm gonna jump in with all the ways we said goodbye. It was a collaborative work between Beatrice Williams, Lauren Willig, and Karen White. And I have read a bunch of Beatrice Williams in the back mm-hmm. in, in, in in other times. And I found that this one had a lot of the same components. So for someone who is drawn to a combination of historical fiction 
with romance and a mystery element going on, um, this one might be of interest. And okay. I think I've read Karen White before, some of hers. So I don't know if, if her work individually will have the same format, but in this case, the collaborators have created uh, three different time frames mm -hmm. where in each of those time frames, we have a very strong female protagonist. So our story is focused on these three ladies. In 1914, we meet Aura Lee, and she is living at the very ritzy Paris Hotel, uh, the, sorry, the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Okay. Not a ritzy hotel. And she is being raised by her American mother, and she goes away from Paris with her German father, sorry, French father, and they go to the family's ancestral estate in the French countryside. But when they get there, the Germans have arrived. This is 19, August 19, I'm sorry, it's 1914. So we're right. now so jumping into like World War I. World War I, One. yeah. It's right at the start of World War I. The Germans have arrived and taken over this family estate to Ooh. use it as a headquarters. Okay. So now... Aurelie meets a young man in one of the German officers who she had met in a previous time during her debutante days in Paris. So there's some action happening in 1914. We have some romance happening, and um, we'll leave we'll leave Aurelie for a moment. When when we get to 19. Um, for, sorry, 1942, our main character is Marguerite, D or Daisy, Villon. Now, she is married to a French gentleman who, okay, 1942, we're at the start of World War II. Right. Are, are these characters related in any way, by blood, so or just... So, we don't okay. get told that right okay. up front. Okay. They like to kind of leave us hanging. Okay. I, I think in this case, it becomes more transparent sooner than later it's not okay. there's not a moment where you go oh my gosh it, that's how they you're like oh i think i see this coming okay but there are so spoiler alert mm -hmm. there are some <laughs> some family connections okay but you don't always know going in, in into these books so now i was just talking about daisy and she is married to a gentleman who chooses to be a Nazi sympathizer. But she, Daisy, starts doing work for the French Resistance. She is... Oh, I bet that puts some strain on the marriage. She doesn't necessarily <laughs> tell her husband what she's doing. Smart. So she is connected with a British forger, who she only knows as Legrand, and... She's delivering papers that he has created to help the Jewish, to help uh, soldiers behind enemy lines, to help people get where they need to be. So they okay. have their identity papers. And then there's romance and there's war. And yeah, now we'll jump to 1964. So Barbara Langford is the widow of a gentleman who was a World War II prisoner of war, and he has a family estate in England. But after her husband dies, Barbara is contacted by an American lawyer looking into trying to track down the identity of a French resistance fighter turned traitor named Lafleur. So there are romances and family connections and mystery and historical aspects. Um, the locations are all captured and yet the mystery doesn't get spelled out till the very end. But, okay. But it's, uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, what, there wasn't any surprising history. There wasn't a big amount of covering World War II the way you would see from yeah you're not going to learn a lot of new history okay. but it all it all fits in to um to the different time frames all right well sounds like a good one if you like historical if you so. like historical 
heavier on the romance than the actual history. Okay. Well, my last one is Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. This is a fairly new book. I It was one of those books that was available through Book of the Month Club as an extra. I didn't order it, and then I immediately had regret as soon as I click the button to order my box. And I'm, oh, oh, I should have gotten that one. But um, so I ended up listening to the audiobook, And it is also read by Marin Ireland, who is an excellent narrator. Yeah. And she does a great job voicing the different characters. This is definitely not a plot driven book. It is very much a character study. And all I can say is if you like a book about rich people behaving badly, <laughs> This is a book for you. Okay. So um, the author, Jenny Jackson, is actually an editor for a major publishing company. So this is her debut novel. Um, the story is told through the point of view of sisters Georgiana and Darley Stockton and their sister-in-law, Sasha. So the Stocktons are old money, Mayflower money, trust fund money, the 1% wealthy kind of money that I can't even imagine this kind of money, but it's fun to read about. Sasha, on the other hand, hails from a very middle-class family from Rhode Island, and she marries into this exclusive family and finds herself living in the, the historic home on Pineapple Street, which is a real street in New York City. I actually saw an Instagram post of somebody holding up this book cover near the street sign, and I was like, that, my friend, is awesome. So... Um, so the first sister is Darley. She is the oldest. She was a very, um, very busy and very, you know, intelligent woman in her own right. She was a businesswoman moving up the ranks of, I forget, it was one of the major banks or trading companies. But she ends up marrying and she gives up her career to raise a family. And she has two children. She had to make a decision when she had the children like whether she would continue to receive money from her trust fund or her husband, who was also very prominent, I believe he was an investor, like, or to, to let the trust fund go to her children. But once she made that decision, there was no going back. Mm. So she decides she's putting her trust in her husband and she's doing it. She is letting the money go to her kids and she's cutting herself off. Um, but when things get tough... She wonders if that was the right decision to make. Georgiana is the youngest Stockton sister. She's an excellent tennis player, very, very athletic. She's also very idealistic. She wants to make a difference in the world. She thinks she's doing this because she's working for a, a not-for-profit. She ends up meeting a coworker. She, she has a massive crush on this man, and they start having you know, a relationship, she thinks. So, um, and then Sasha. Sasha is dressed, she's in love with her husband. His name is Cord. How, how upper class does that sound? I don't know anybody by that name. No, I don't either. When you hear that name, it's I almost, see boat shoes. It's almost as bad as Trip. you know? <laughs> Trip and Cord, they were best friends. Um, so, Sasha is just trying to fit in. Her family... All she's thinking is at the wedding that they are going to embarrass her because she has that cousin who can't hold his drink. And, you know, there's different, like, black sheep in the family. They all run around in their boats and party and so forth. So um, they, the sisters view her, they call her the GD, which is short for gold digger. <laughs> um, they highly resent any change that she wants to make to personify, uh, like personalize the house on Pineapple Street to make it more suitable for what she and her husband want and what she might want for her own children. Like literally this house, the way they describe it, and it's pretty funny, is like a museum. And she's kind of going around poking fun like, did your family sail? Because it just has the majestic sailing pictures and everything you would kind of typically a tribute to like a really uber wealthy family and the mother of this family who was also a tennis player and does a lot of charity things like her claim to fame is she can really organize a good party 
like theme parties are her jam. And when she has a theme party, you better like be with that theme. Um, so they are having a big family party. And this is how Sasha's life is going is she doesn't know what to wear. She's very nervous. So she ends up putting like on a nice white silk blouse and black slacks while the all throughout the party, people are thinking she's a member of the catering staff. And her two sister-in-laws are laughing. Um, so, yeah, they're not very nice. But eventually, they both run into problems. Like, there are issues with the man that Georgiana has fallen in love with. That she should not have fallen in love with this man. I don't want to give too much away. Um, Darlie's husband loses his job. Mm -hmm. And then she's made that decision about the trust fund. Right. So she's in limbo and she doesn't want her parents to know because she's actually married a man. And I can't remember now. I believe he was Korean. So that was a big, huge thing, you know, to begin with. The fact that she actually married someone different. Um, and the, the reason why her parents embraced him, of course, is because he made so much money. But now that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So although it's light in tone, the book covers a lot of more serious topics like of gentrification and what does it mean to be like making a difference like with this not-for-profit. Um, Georgiana, Georgiana got on my nerves quite a bit. But, you know, finally in the end, they all kind of come around. They all have some resolution and their lives do get better. So it ends on a more hopeful note. I wouldn't say it's like cookie cutter stamped, but um, it does end, you know, somewhat nicely. And all the characters experience some sort of redemption. That's what I'll say. So if you like stories of like kind of looking into a world that you are not in, it's fun. Okay. Yeah. So... Pineapple Street. Pineapple Street. Okay, I'm going to jump in with a kind of a sci-fi fantasy, heavy on humor. Okay. The title is All Systems Red. It's written by Martha Wells. And it's actually the first book in a series. So if you find that you like this character, you can go forward. Um, the Murder Bot Diaries series kicked off in 2017. I um, I personally have made it up to book four, and um, they're coming out with book seven okay. later this year. Okay. I think so, Kirstra liked this author a lot. I know she talked about some other books that yeah. Martha Wells wrote, and I believe she's reading. She recommended this series to me because she's like, you might like it. You don't have to be like a huge sci-fi nerd it's, to like this book. Right. It's, the the sci-fi aspects are... We're in a spacefaring future. We have um, contracts go to the lowest bidder, and safety isn't necessarily the primary concern. Um, but the Murderbot Diary series did uh, win some Nebula Awards, some Hugo Awards, Locus Awards. Um, so it, it's, it's getting some good press mm -hmm. in terms of, of how it's received. Okay. So... The story focuses on a security unit. He, uh, I can't even say he. The, the character always refers to itself in um, a more neutral way. And uh, it's half human, half android. Okay. Where the, uh, this particular security unit has hacked its governor module. That is the controls that allow the corporation to, uh, to provide it with instructions, and it is supposed to always respond directly to orders as given. But uh, that doesn't always go so well, which is why this character refers to itself as Murderbot. There was some history that created that particular nickname, and now this character is trying to go forward, and uh, really all the character, the uh, all that this character really wants to do is sit back and watch some entertainment feed and have the humans leave it alone. So uh, we do have a situation where the security it is assigned as security assisting a scientific exploration team and there's some stuff that goes wrong and I don't want to tell you exactly how it all f unfolds but um, 
Is it like a, a murder mystery or some type of mystery, or is it just an adventure story? So there are the unknown elements of what happened on this particular planet. The scientists are exploring and trying to understand something that's going on. And you really, in book one, don't really learn just what was going on. You only know that the scientific expedition is attacked and Murderbot jumps into action and saves the humans, even though Murderbot would really rather not be bothered. Um, but uh, if the, the, I, I wrote down the quote because I liked it so much. And in their corner, all they had was Murderbot, who just wanted everyone to shut up and leave it alone so it could watch the entertainment feed all day. So um, Murderbot has its own priorities, but has hacked its governor module so it can make choices and uh, try not to hang out with the humans any more than it absolutely has to. <laughs> there are days at the library I feel the same way, yeah. Murderbot. <laughs> yep. Oh my. So the, the other thing that I found intriguing about this book, if you like it, it's only 144 pages, so it's more of oh, a okay. novella than a, an actual long drawn out situation. And uh, you can jump through. In fact, I would recommend grab books one, two, three, because the story arc really continues. It's not. Are they all fairly short? Books one through four are. Okay. I understand that book five is a full length novel. All right. Good to but know. Six and seven go back to the novella short form. Huh. All right. So. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been f a fun ride. And. Uh, Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today and learning a, a lot of different eclectic choices here for you to think about reading. I did want to mention that we're going to a one episode for each of the summer months. So June, July, and August, we will have one new episode just to kind of give us a little break. And whether you know it or not, summer is one of the busiest times of the library. We have people going on vacation. I have two weddings in my future. So yes, yes, we will be just doing one new episode per month. But thanks for joining us. And thank you, Kim, for it's joining us. a pleasure. Awesome. Well, we hope to have you back again. Sounds so. good. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library.